Hey guys, this is Elise. I'm the organizer of the project Catholic Christian Friends for Intersectional Racial Healing. This is my intro for the panel discussions with friends. I decided to self-disclose after much consideration because of two reasons. First, I wanted to equalize the field of conversation by not only being a moderator, but also an equal participant with my friends. Given that this project is about friends demonstrating that racial experiences can be non-threatening talking points for personal relationships. And second, I have a civic duty to demonstrate that Asians are not invisible in the national and international conversation on racial experiences, that Asians are not fake whites with so-called privileges, and to show that Asians are incorrectly stereotyped as submissive and invisible or silent. You may be able to recall from an earlier video I shared about this project that there are generally four types of racial experience narratives. They're the following. One, identity development and internal experience or development of racial identity. Two, microaggressions in the culture during personal and professional exchanges in everyday moments and everyday relationships. Three, physical and sexual or, in, or sexual intimidation, aggression, violence, escalating to near-death experiences and sometimes death. And four, systemic issues experienced through school curriculum, company HR policies and procedures, legal bills introduced into governance spaces and other official and government auditing and documentation archives and codified laws. In this intro video, I will share about my intentions for the project, why I'm being involved in it equally, and my stories. The stories I share are divided between this intro video and the video from the Ohio channel where I provided public testimony on stories that fall under the second, third, and fourth categories of racial experience narratives, and, um, and they're in the public record. Now I'll share in this video a bit from the first category of narratives, which is identity and internal development. Something that my uncle said to me several years ago was, you're a collector of stories. I've lived in multiple cultures, multiple worlds, so to speak, my entire life. The way I've navigated spaces is to collect stories and to develop a loyalty to a quality of relationship and persons based on how God placed them in my life. For example, I'm very loyal to family, my parents, my brothers, my relatives. I am loyal to my friends and I expect loyalty in return. I hear their stories, I ask for their stories, I carry their stories in my heart. One moment I recall from when I was a very little girl was a turning point when I realized where my identity lay and where it came from. I must have been three or four years old. I learned from my family, well, I learned from my family way before I was three and four, that God is my God and I am his little daughter, God's princess daughter, and I internalized that in my heart. I learned from the church when I was about three, four years old that in God, we are all equal. When we go to heaven, my parents are my siblings in Christ, too. But here on earth, God made them my parents. At about the same time, when I was a very little girl, I had another turning point when my eyes were opened. My parents had to prepare me for a world they could not fully control or protect me from forever. I was in elementary school when my father told me that I must show less emotion. That in the dominant culture out there, outside of our home, if I show emotion first or emotion at all, I will lose right away. Even if the content of what I have to say is worthwhile, I would lose. And as I grew up, I saw that in many ways he was right. That is the rule I must be aware of in a white dominant American culture and in white black binary dominant racial discourses. But I didn't buckle or efface myself of expressive emotion, nor did I submit and make myself invisible. If I had something to say, I always found a way to say it. I never felt it was right for the culture or the world or non-parental figures to tell me how I should see myself or what I should do with my life or how I do anything. That is not their God-given authority. Something else that I've noticed in my life is how much I've enjoyed having friends of similar as well as different backgrounds. 
Since I was a little girl, I've consistently had a very best friend within my same ethnicity or race, as well as tripods of best friends where there's myself, an Asian girl, one white girl, and one black girl. Sometimes um, sometimes it was like a, a guy and a girl and a guy and a guy, but anyhow, it was always like a tripod of diversity, which is kind of fun. And maybe that's a part of why I have a great hope that we can have conversations in our family, circles of friends, communities, and nationally, internationally, where everyone of any background comes to the table to discuss racial experiences and could potentially even experience racial healing in the process. And maybe that's part of why, you know, I feel bold enough to do a project like this and moderate the conversations. As you may know from seeing my testimony at the Ohio State House, um, I stood as a proponent of SCR 14, Racism is a Public Health Crisis in Ohio, earlier this month. And you may have seen it through the Ohio Channel. I'll link it below this video post so that you could check it out if you haven't had a chance yet. I have experienced discriminations and violence by members of different racial groups, as I shared in that testimony. So. I know from my own pain, from racial prejudice, and also I can empathize with others about the pain that they may have experienced due to racism. I've been fortunate to have a thick personal history of very strong, very loyal friendships shared with people who both look like me and, and do not look like me. As a result, I have been able to see the perpetrators of racism and racial violence against me personally as representatives of their own broken selves and their own broken family systems, instead of as representatives of their entire race or entire superficial grouping of some kind. My intention with my work and with this project is to desegregate the racial conversation, to desegregate the race-focused tables and increase and elevate the language development for our own benefits as well as the identity development of children who are the future. I look forward to connecting and chatting with my friends in this project, and I welcome you who are viewing this project to connect with me and to connect with your friends to start a conversation too. All that said, um, I, I realize one thing that, um, that could be misconstrued from what I just shared. I do realize there are systemic issues, and I know that personally from my own experiences and that's what I testified to as a proponent of SCR 14 at the Ohio State House. Um, but for the purposes of this particular project, uh, we're really going to be focusing on personal conversation, personal narratives, and, um, and connecting. Connecting across the divide, bridging the gap, bridging the divides, and creating trust, building trust, earning it through conversation. Stay tuned for the upcoming conversations with my friends and I. God bless.